Thank you to our friends at Audi for making this video possible and for all the programs that we do at Lee Initiative. The Lee Initiative taught me that like 10 people can make such a big difference. It's all about community. Other empowering women, uplifting each other. Sometimes it's just about making sure that they know I'm there for them at any point in their career. It's crazy what teamwork and a group of people that care can do. Cheers. Cheers. So this is a kind of sake. Makali, so it's a rice drink, unfiltered, so you're gonna taste not only the alcohol part of it, but like it's cloudy, like you have the, the sol the rice solids are in there. When I go to Korea, I drink this all the time. It's, it's nonstop. You wanna order some dinner? Yeah. Yes, I do. All right, so how familiar are you with Korean food? Both not, of you. Not very. You're gonna show me the ways of I'm Korean gonna, food. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do my best. Listen, I trust Beverly. Okay. We were on Top Chef together. Let's just order everything off the menu. It seems like a okay. small menu. So this is how we do it. That's we how we do it. Yeah. Just, I'll just have it all. Any Thanks allergies, so restrictions you should be aware of? Vegetarian. Vegetarian. Okay. On that note, I'm gonna just bring up a little blast from the past here. Okay. Sarah Spain, although we know her as a prominent sports writer, used to host a food show. I did. My first Chicago's ever TV best. gig, Chicago's Best. You ate meat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you ate a lot of stuff. You were eating like bacon and all that. Oh, so that wasn't, you weren't vegetarian back no, then. No, no, no. To be honest, it was usually cognitive dissonance for most of my life was I'm not going to think too hard about what's actually yeah. happening and what I'm eating. I'm just going to eat it. And then I watched a video of a little mini pig named Pickles <laughs> and his dad calls him in from the other room, pickles, belly rub, and this little pig ran around the corner and then slipped and then slid into the room belly up to get the, and I was like, why do I not eat my dog, but I'll eat this pig that's like really smart. So I'll just take a break. And then I just decided, I'll just take a break from all of it. And that was five years ago. So I'll, I'll let Jeff take this one. Jeff, why do we eat pigs? Well. They're delicious. Yeah. They're delicious. And, and, and they, they, they're, they're, they're extremely they're delicious. Yeah, they're yeah, exquisitely yeah. delicious. But also, you know, so many of the ways that people cook and the ways that people eat have to do with extracting nourishment wherever people could find it, right? And the choice not to eat meat, I think, is, is a very sensible one and a very beautiful one, but it's also not possible in many places in the world, right? And many cultures where um, people were eating offal, they're eating, you know, the insides of an animal. They did so because they had to, right? And so delicious dishes um, surfaced from those habits and those traditions. And I, I ultimately, for me, I feel like my belief system is rooted in that line from Michael Pollan, like eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Yeah. Right. I think that's just beautiful and brilliant. And I, I do believe that it's sensible for all of us to reduce the amount of meat we eat. As a professional food writer, it's difficult for me to mm. cut it out altogether. Well, that's a big part of it that I would say is like, I actually believe in the circle of life and the cycle of life. And a lot of animals eat other animals and that's how they survive. And that's how humans have survived for a long time. It's just that at some point you have to reconcile our current practices with the way it used to be. So this is uh, the first uh, course of the evening. Uh, so this is the gobengi muchen. There's going to be some moks is, in there. Which is snails, right? Yep, sea snails. Uh, yeah, some cabbage, carrots. Uh, there's gochujang, gochugaru, and then uh, samyun noodles underneath it all. So let me ask you this, Sarah. As a chef, when you own a restaurant, we're living in this sort of peak time of allergies and food restrictions, and I don't eat this, and I don't yes. want that. Yes, yes, yes. And was vegetarianism the first movement where the customers came in and said, you know what, I want something and you're gonna change the menu and you're gonna influence a, a chef's menu because I demand it. And was that, did that open the doors for where we are now, where now every single person comes in and goes, well, fine, but I'm this, I'm that, I don't eat nightshade, I don't eat. I understand the frustration of chefs like having to accommodate all these different requests. But there is a little bit of, I think, give if you're paying for an experience mm -hmm. that you should have, within reason, uh, the ability to request. So there is a restaurant here called Rock Spin. It's no longer open. It was good and it was well received. But if you ordered a steak there, and this is when I used to mm -hmm. eat meat, they would not serve it to you any way except for one way. Mm -hmm. You're in theory supposed to enjoy it because that's how the chef intended it. Mm -hmm. But for something like that, if you've eaten enough steaks, you know how you like them? I don't believe the customer is always right. Mm -mm. But I, I do agree that there, there should be some sense of accommodation. 
and some of the best restaurants in the world will figure it out. So my response to that is... Yeah, I want to hear from the chef. Would you go pay tickets to a Rolling Stone concert and then tell Mick Jagger how to sing his song? No. And so you shouldn't do that at a restaurant. Okay. Whoa. So I agree with that, but I also think to myself, you're not a food critic. You're not going to tell everybody yeah. that the chef screwed up and made your steak too cooked. That's what you wanted. Let's pretend you're on a job. You're here. You're eating. You're working. Let's pretend you have a job. <laughs> no. And not Believe just me. this like cushy life. Yeah. Like what do you do? Like cushy like, life. <laughs> the guy last night somebody was like, "Well, you write for a living." I was like, "Oh no, I don't make a living at it." <laughs> Believe me. So as a food critic, do you ding a restaurant if they don't cater towards you know whatever's in fat at the moment? Because part of your job is also to sort of have your finger on the pulse of what people want out of restaurants. Personally. I feel a little aggrieved that people have these belief systems now. I feel these belief systems about eating to some degree have replaced religion. Hmm. They, they, they create some sense of control in people's lives. Like I am gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan, right. and I don't eat nightshades. And you're like, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, but like, no, the answer is no. Because I, what I'm looking for is places that do what they do really well. Mm. Like, you don't ding Willie Nelson because he didn't make a funk album. I've sort of tried to contextualize it as I'm always looking for the three C's in any restaurant, which are creativity, comfort, and cool. Some balance of those. Parachute is a great example of all three. There's creative expression by the chefs, but there's also, it's not so far out you know, of the solar system that you're just eating weird experiments. Mm -hmm. There's some degree of comfort in sort of satisfaction to yeah. it, right? Elemental satisfaction. And also you're like, this is a pretty fucking cool place to be. So one of the reasons why I invited you guys to dinner together is I wanted to ask this central question, which there, there, to me there's, there's something going on in the sports world and in the food world oh. that overlap. And as we're going through Nachos this- Nachos in a helmet. <laughs> I'm all about that. <laughs> I endorse you nachos. Think, you think, you think they have that here? You think we can yeah, order that here? Yeah, but Korean style. As we're going through this reckoning, yeah. right? As we're, we're, we're writing about social issues in the food world, you're on the radio every day. You're mm -hmm. on TV every day. You're funny, you're okay. irreverent, you're, you're smart, you, you got your stats down, you got your analysis down, you're witty. You, there, that is just one portion of it. And mm -hmm. I think you really do a really good job of balancing I'm going to be entertaining, I'm going to be yeah, factual, I'm going to, but if you're going to bring up Deshaun Watson, here's my take, and right. I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. What does the food world need to learn about how you guys do it in the sports world? Mm. I think context matters, mm -hmm. and I think intention matters, and I also think transparency. So I personally have a really difficult time glossing over things like sexual crimes in order to talk yeah. about how great someone's arm is. Other people do not want to talk about this, and they are more than happy to stick to the football side of things. I understand that not everyone's gonna want the social issues with their sports. So I think there's a choice, first of all, but to just ignore it is how you allow enabling mm. and, and, that's and continuation. Do you, feel, do you feel pressure to, to go either on, in either direction? I, I do think there's a, this assumption, it may be true in, 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 in covering sports as well, where they, the fans or the readers, they, they assume you're omniscient, right? They're like, how did you not know that that chef was a bad actor? How did you not know that he was, he was doing these terrible things behind the scenes? And I'm like, I hate to break it to you, but they, do, they don't tell us, right. right? Like, I mean, I will tell you absolutely that I've flown into cities and people on Instagram have DM'd me, people have texted me and said, don't go there. And um, I factor it in. I will say that I factor it in. It, it, in, and there have been there have been times when I've decided not to go to that restaurant because, no, I don't want to be advocating for, um, you know, egregious behavior. You know, that's very very important to how I view a place. It's not just the food. This looks incredible. Insane. I can't wait to dig in. So Ed, I wanted to ask you about the Bosom yes. because 
comes with oysters. Mm -hmm. Is that a traditional thing? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, this is something that would be eaten on special occasions. Pork belly, braised, chilled, raw oysters. It usually has a really stinky um, shrimp, uh, sort of soy sauce, uh, uh, gochujang, samjang with it. And then, yeah, you just wrap it up, make a lettuce wrap, like and eat it. Like activity plate? Mm-hmm. Mm. The oyster is essential. And this, yeah. most Korean pancakes, it's a lot of flour. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right, mixed more and then, even, right? yeah. Less topographical. And it's more starchy. And this vegetable. is so vegetable. And the vegetables Thriving. are actually, um, they're al dente. So you can, you still have the crisp, the chew, like there's some of it's chewy, some of it's still crispy. The peppers add a nice little heat. Mm -hmm. And then there's just enough binding to hold it together. Even though it's still in the traditional realm, yes. it's a nice take on a pajang. It's really good. And then this is, uh, she made this vegetarian just for you, Sarah. This is, um, this is our, our version of a miso soup, tenjang jjiga. There's so much commercial miso out there. And, and it's kind of like ketchup, right? It's, it's mass produced and you can taste it. Like I can taste, um, this is a really country rustic style of tenjang. It's saltier. It's earthier. Mm. You can you can smell the fermentation. Like mm. to me, this takes me back to childhood in in a flash in an instant. It's just like mm. I remember remember all that. And then you know, caviar is nice too. <laughs> <laughs> so bougie. All right. So I I wrote an article a couple of years ago about food criticism, and and I think some food critics thought I was attacking them, and I really wasn't. Mm. How do you know? What good Korean food is? How do if your if your experience and, and breadth of it is limited, how do you judge something or how do you critique something that you just may not know a lot about? Everyone has blind spots. Mm -hmm. Everyone has things they're very familiar with and things they're ignorant about. I think it's important to own your ignorance, to ask a lot of questions, to be transparent, to be porous, essentially. If you don't know about something, you ask about you. You know, like tell me the story of it. Tell me well, about. Well, so that's what I want to ask you because I don't want to single you out it's as reporting. the straight it's like, old right. white man. But like, how do you find that balance in your criticism and your work, where you you've earned your position and your clout and your agency? But would it also be even more relatable and endearing for you to bring in somebody and to say, I actually consulted, instead of just doing the research behind the scenes, but mm -hmm. to actually say, I brought someone with me, or in this case, I didn't feel it was possible for me to accurately discuss this. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's that monochromatic or that simple to think like, well, the, the white guy doesn't know Thai food because no. I, it, it's not, like for instance, Peking duck changed my life when I was like seven years old. I thought it was the most delicious thing I ever had. I mean, it's not like I grew up on uh, rustic French food just because of my last name, right? right. So like everybody's perspective is more and complex. I would say, to, to your, in response to what you said too, having a person of that culture is helpful, but it can also be prejudicial too. Right. So if I bring my mom mm -hmm. to this dinner, uh. right? She's Korean, she knows more than any of us about Korean food, but she would look at this and go, fuck, that's not authentic. Right. It's not, that's not Korean, right? And right. I argue with my mom all day long because she goes, my so mom tells me, she goes, you don't know how to cook Korean food. Mm -hmm. I go, what are you talking about? She goes, that's not Korean food. Right. That's some shitty American version of Korean well, food. Well, there, there, there's this whole idea of, of, of grandmas being revered in food media and food culture. And it's like, I, I've, I've dined out in New York City at really excellent Italian restaurants with people from Italy. Mm -hmm. And they push the food away. They are like, nope, this is wrong. This is not how my nonna made it. Right. It's my grandma would never make it that way. It's wrong. You have this in sports too. Right? Don't you have a, a whole oh. group of audience people go, well, basketball is not being played the right way now. And, and, yeah. and, and the, the sport has Bob changed. Bob Ryan of is... the Boston Globe, who's been at it forever, is on a show with me. And so it's great because you've got this guy who's literally decades and decades, but he hates the three-point shot. Yeah. He hates it. He doesn't oh. ap respect and appreciate watching the Warriors. He can say it's great that Steph Curry can hit it, but the game isn't the same anymore. And I do what think... What do you think? Um, Evolve the, or die. The, yeah. Evolve or die. One of the most fascinating things to me was I didn't like the style of James Harden. He's still not my favorite. But he has this shot where he dribbles forward, mm -hmm. takes two steps yep. back, and shoots a three. And I was always like, he's traveling, he's traveling. And then I heard him say, it says you get two steps. It doesn't say in what direction. 
and so he's exploiting the rules so he can <laughs> right, do that. Right, to do something that you just hadn't thought of, kind of in the way that they literally used to change the rules so that people couldn't dunk at first. Mm -hmm. They were like, whoa, 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 dunk? What are we doing here? Shoot the ball. And so you have to then be willing to say, the way I've always known it might not be the best. And then when it changes and it sucks, you can also say, hey, this sucks. You know what's interesting about parachutes is they used to have a dish of Bing bread here yes. that I've read about. So I was fascinated the last time yeah. I came here because it was after it had closed or, or like re-evaluated itself. Yeah. And I was like, I'm so excited for that bread. Yeah. And I couldn't understand why they got rid of the most popular thing. Well, I want to talk with Beverly about gotta, that because- You got to take a risk sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know. mm. But it had bacon and cheese and sour cream in it. I mean, it's not it was Korean. A, no, but it sounds like she something wanted, people want to eat. <laughs> I mean, Chicago itself is, it's almost like its own city state. You know, it has these city specific foods like the Chicago hot dog or the hot beef sandwich we see in the bear, you know? Yep, deep dish pizza. Please don't. We made it, we're there now. We made it this long don't start on the deep without dish. getting into deep don't dish. And when I mentioned dish. it for go. the purpose of the conversation, it was not to set you up to degrade a lasting she... cultural institution. What's not to like? People Everything. are like, oh, there's so much cheese and bread. Everything. What's not to like? She's the biggest apologist for, for deep dish <laughs> no, pizza. No, apologist is I a word you use when something requires it. apologizing for. With I celebrate field. it because it deserves to be celebrated. Mm. Yeah, I just, I'm sorry, I gotta oh, feed you. No, I'm all, gotta, oh, awesome. Oh, that's cute, guys. This is what meat lovers do <laughs> to each other. Hmm? Just feed each other your meat. Isn't that good? With it's the so daikon radish wrap? Mm. Oh, so that's part that. of the activity plate. Yeah. Mm. Another thing I love about Korean food is you feed each other. When I'm done, <laughs> you know what? I, one thing I love about Korean food is I, I feel good after eating it. Like there's not a lot of bread. Mm. It's not like heaps of pasta or um, you know deep dish pizza or something like that where mm -hmm. you leave. <laughs> where, where you leave satisfied. <laughs> where you leave feeling <laughs> bloated. We're gonna go out for deep dish pizza right yeah, after. Yeah, hell yeah. Oh, fuck. We're gonna do it. <laughs> At Esquire, I. I help put together the best new restaurants list every year. I go around the country and look for the best new restaurants Tough in the gig. country. Well, it actually is. It, 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 in some way, you know what? It's weird. I mean, I'm 55, um, and at one point I was concerned the job was going to kill me. I mean, I'll tell you, there was one week. I this is this is true. I I started the first day of the week in Asheville, North Carolina. The next day, inadvisedly, I drove to Birmingham, Alabama to eat at Automatic Seafood and Oysters. The next day, I drove to Atlanta. Oh, the next day, I flew to Miami. The next day, I flew to Austin, oh. Texas. The next day, I flew to Los Angeles and appeared in Top Chef, actually. Right. And the next day, I flew home. And in each town, Miami in particular, I think I had six or seven meals, wow. right? So I came home and my wife was like, you look awful. <laughs> Ed and I went out in, in Washington, D.C. one night and had three dinners. And here's the crazy thing. So as a food critic, right, so I have to go to three dinners with this guy. Yeah. As a food critic, he's sitting there, no matter how delicious the food is, he'll take two bites no. and push the plate away. I try. And then you clean. And I'm just clearing because I like can't a not eat. Yeah, I you was trying to warn him. I was like, Ed, you don't want to do that. And by the, <laughs> by the last dinner, I was in so much pain and just hunched out. I'm like, I can't fucking eat anymore. Yeah. All right, so I think we're in for a really good uh, dessert treat here. Ooh. Hi, oh everyone. Uh, and the chef herself. Beverly, before we even say, I just want to say, bravo. Bravo, oh, thank you. So good. That <laughs> meal was, was really stupendous. Oh. Loved it. Thank Loved you. Everybody. Oh, it's my pleasure to cook for you. What do we got here? Popping su, hoji cha ice cream, topped with a little bit of soybean powder. Um, inside, you got little treats like mochi and azuki beans that are sweetened, mikluk farm peaches, mm. um, puff barley. So, are you saying that the actual ice part was made from frozen hoji cha? It's actually um, a hoji cha tea, which we put in our snow ice machine. Yeah. Okay. It's fancy. And just it's, like your grandma used to. Yeah, just like my <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not waiting. Ed always has to be the first bite. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's just a perfect light ending to a Yeah. Um, it's such an interesting meal. Um, texture. 
So do you ever get nervous cooking for other chefs, Beverly? Uh, of course. I do. Like a real no, ass asshole don't. like Ed that you know is gonna be tough. You're so good, you don't get nervous. I remember one time we had family meal on Top Chef and I think I fucked up the rice. And I was really kind of <laughs> like, I'm the one Asian American who does a lot of Asian cooking. I remember Sarah was helping me with the rice. I was like, no, put some more water. I was doing the hand thing, you know? I was like, no, I think it needs more water. And then it was like all blown out. I was like, oh shit. And this is, that was my, and that was all the rice we had. That's all, and that's <laughs> all we ever Sarah. talk about to this day. So we met on Top Chef. And I've watched you, and we've been friends ever since, and we talk, and, and um, sometimes I, I look at the camaraderie of French chefs. Right. Or black chefs in America, or Latino chefs in America, and they have this incredible bond, because they know what it's like to be other here. Yes. When we were kids, our food was considered weird. Right. right, so right. We, we, when, when we were like adolescents. Like you know, the lunchbox in Yeah, yeah. like I wasn't yeah. going out and being like, look at my kimchi, right? Oh, it was right. like, it was like, I tried to be as American. I was like, look at my peanut butter. Right. <laughs> I, I almost feel like uh, there was a, a little bit of shame to being Korean, you know, calling it Korean cuisine. There's real evidence that like, there is like, um, bias towards pricing, bias towards how much profit you can make. I feel like there's something missing. Mm -hmm. And and is it because there were only a few spots? That's what I'm that's right? what I was for, wondering for if an you were Asian getting chef it. to be right, is it competitive? known. So then you go, okay, I can't necessarily support because the like, huge thing has always yeah. been, oh, all the women hate each other and they're right. all catty yeah. and, oh, in, wow. in sports because, again, it's one. Yeah. Or, like, I remember when I first started, Aaron Andrews left ESPN to go somewhere and someone mm -hmm. was like, you could do that. You're as pretty as her. And I was yeah. like, first of all, I'm not. Yeah. But secondly, that's not the job. Yeah. Yes. So, the, and that the, would make so you competitive. Ce celebration of, can't be marginalization or tokenization or any of those those past forms. But it makes you less likely to, to connect yeah. because you're yeah. like, wait, no, no, this is the one spot and it's going to be mine. Right. And if I do this, maybe I'm helping So how is it, power. would you say right now, there is a camaraderie or support group? 100%. Group? Yeah. Yeah. It's a mutual admiration society as far as all the women in the business yeah. that I know because we're pushing back on the sort of accepted idea that there's there can only be so many of us and that we should right. fight with each other. And, and Jeff? I, I did want to ask you about the evolution of Parachute and how that reflects your own journey. Went to culinary school, uh, classically trained, work under um, mostly like European style cooking. Um, and I it just hit, a, like I guess you call it midlife cooks mm -hmm. crisis. Um, <laughs> I was like, you know what I'm missing? I feel like I'm missing my roots or something about the cooking. I feel like I'm missing, like I'm passionate about cooking, but something's still missing. So then I went to Korea and Japan for about two and a half months. And the food culture was so exciting to me that I came back to Chicago, like, this is what I want to do. So I ended up at uh, Red Light, which is a Pan-Asian mm. restaurant. I uh, celebrated my 21st birthday there. Oh, OK. <laughs> it was so good. Uh, what year was that? Oh, we don't need like, to get what? into it. OK. <laughs> Bless and <Beverly>. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was there. Um, yeah, that was, a couple years ago. That was, <laughs> but it was like, you know, most of the restaurants back then were basically Pan-Asian. So it would have like Pad Thai next to all the wasabi fusion, butter, yeah, and, you know, the, next to Octopus Kimchi, yeah. all the greatest hits. And, and there always was a Buddha head yeah. in every restaurant. Yeah. And either you emulate like the ma majority group mm -hmm. or you, you're you off-casted. And I think our first menu, like, oh, let's let's do an Asian bread. Maybe we do an Asian bread program. So I tested it out. I was like, oh, it's, it's OK. It just needs something different. And, People love baked potato flavors. <laughs> Bacon, cheddar, scallion. And then that was on our menu. It was the one thing that never changed because everyone's like, that bread, that bread. And it's like, we had so many amazing dishes, but that's the one thing they remembered. People were calling that Korean bread. It wasn't Korean, it was almost like misinformed. Like, and people didn't understand what Korean, they, like Koreans have this bean bread. And it's like, oh it's my gosh. Weird, like a blessing and a curse though. It, it was, was a blessing. So popular, popular, it was so popular. also you know, yeah. created these issues that you hadn't planned for. Yeah, and I think like, I think of, we're trying to go to the, the heart of like, if you cook well for yourself, if you cook like without thinking, oh, should I do with this? Because Americans will like it. Instead of just cooking, yeah. like, oh, I think it needs this. So like being more authentic that way. Say one I thing, because like... I don't feel like I don't really cook Korean food, you know. But when I see someone who does, and who does it right, and who does it with like the love and passion that you bring to it, I don't know why. There's something about it, 
as as being from the ancestral roots. Mm -hmm. Like I feel so proud, mm -hmm. and I get and I and I just like I'm just beaming right now because it was a really beautiful meal. So. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Delicious. This Thank is so you. much fun. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. But keep watching, because right up next is our Audi Lee Initiative Women, Chef, and Spirits Mentorship Program. It's 2022, and in honor of the fifth year of Women, Culinary, and Spirits Program, Chef Lee and I are out here on the road with our partners from Audi, catching up with some of the past mentees to see what they are up to since participating in the program. Katie was in our second class of uh, mentees, and recently she just got promoted to head chef of Red Hog. I just took over as head chef about six months ago. Congratulations. Um, thank you. We do whole animal butchery. We make charcuterie from scratch. We have a great smoking program, and we cook food over the fire, sourcing it locally, building the community, as well as trying to use the leadership skills that I learned. Take me back a little bit. Like, what do you remember from your experience with the Lee Initiative? I would say when I first started the program in 2019, I had very low confidence. So that really was the first big opportunity for me to grow and learn. And also staying in contact with all of the amazing people that I've met. I have this really incredible community of mentors that I look up to that I don't think that I could do this job now without everything that I learned. What are those leadership skills? I think the strongest quality of a leader is being able and being excited to share what you've learned with others. So that's really the kind of culture that I want to create here, and that's the way I want to treat everyone that I work with. How do you want to continue to evolve and grow uh, as a leader, as a chef? The big thing that sticks with me from the Lee Initiative is that you and Lindsay really kind of put your foot down and said, it's up to us to change this industry. No one's gonna do it for us. And it's time to make it more inclusive and make it more of a positive experience for young women and for everyone. And I think that that's even more important now for what you guys started to continue on with everyone that you've shared it with. Make me very proud. <laughs> Tanya Mays is from Lexington, Kentucky, and she was in our second class of Lee Initiative mentees. And she moved from the Lee Initiative and became an accomplished line cook to owning her own business now, Kismet, in a span of two years. When you applied for the Lee Initiative, was the program what you thought it would be? Like, did it play any role in you getting from being a pastry chef to owning your own restaurant? I think it did because with the Lee Initiative, they have an awesome mentorship program. So I was with Nina in Louisiana. I've seen a lot of owners who just own the restaurant and they come in and do their little thing and then you never really see them most of the time. But with Nina, she was there calling out tickets, expo on the line, on the line. It was amazing to see and I wanted to be that involved with my kitchen as much as I could. Do you feel like the leadership that you observed with Nina has bled into how you lead in your own kitchen? I do. Even just the, the other mentees that were in my class, we all had the sense of community. And I think with my kitchen now, like I want everyone to have ownership, feel responsibility, feel like they're valued here. So I want everyone to feel like a leader in their own way, which I feel like the Lee Initiative really taught us that. Do you see yourself as being a mentor one day? I hope so. Would you do that for us? I would. <laughs> I think that would be great. I would have a lot of fun doing that.